Good evening uh, and a very, very warm uh, welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Roly Keating. I'm Chief Executive uh, of the British Library. Uh, and it's very, very good to see so many of you here tonight um, for Ideas in the Bath. Um, and uh, looking around the room, we have no bath for you, but I can promise you non-stop ideas, at least um, when I've ceased talking. And of course, this is the kickoff for the British Library's inspiring science season. Uh, more than a week of events, talks, workshops, there's even an exhibition. Uh, for those of you who I hope have been exploring the library, a lot of surprising work on the art science divide or collision uh, by students from Central St. Martins uh, up the road. And this is a period of intensive discussion, celebration, and debate around science right across the country. What we're doing coincides with uh, National Science and Engineering Week, um, some four and a half thousand events, the length and breadth of the UK. It's also Brain Awareness Week, a lot of stuff going on around brain research. So this is a, a spring hit, although it doesn't feel like that. It's wonderful to feel that people are engaging with ideas and the people and the background to science. And this is not just for specialists, but this is vitally about the dialogue between the specialist and the non-specialist. Uh, and that's one thing the library stands for, is those connections between disciplines, between approaches, between different ways uh, of looking at the world. And I think that spirit of candor, openness, the human element of science is one of the themes we're going to be thinking about tonight, which makes it all the more appropriate uh, that tonight's event is part of our continuing National Life Stories project, our big oral history program here at the library. And in fact, what you are witnessing and engaged in tonight is a further contribution to our oral history program. This is being filmed and recorded and will become part of our permanent record here. And within that program uh, is, and has been now for three years, our oral history of British science. We're very proud of this. This is so far about 100 interviews and counting, some 1,000 hours uh, of encounters with some of the most distinguished names in British and international science, uh, giving extended conversational interviews that track right back to their childhood, their influences, the wider universe they work in, but also going deep into the science and the research that they conducted in their lives. New insights, the inside story of what they do, uh, and candid reflections on themselves and their professions. And I think that'll be some of the spirit, I'm sure, of tonight's conversation. Hitherto, this rather remarkable record has been something for our research community uh, and for our, our own community here to work with. But I'm delighted to announce tonight that in the autumn, uh, we will be launching on the open web, on the British Library website, Voices of Science, which is going to bring this amazing resource to the widest possible public, the widest possible public uh, around the world. Uh, that'll be later in the year, but please do, if you have a few moments to stay around afterwards, uh, on the laptops over there is a glimpse of how this resource is going to appear. It's already very, very compelling. I think the page with featuring uh, Chris Rapley is already up there, so you can compare the real thing with the virtual, the virtual example. Um, it remains only for me, though, to thank the people who've made that possible, in particular uh, the Arcadia Fund uh, and the personal support of Lisbeth Rousing there. We've also had support from the Royal Commission for the 1851 exhibition, still going strong, still supporting innovation and creativity. Uh, thanks to our academic partner, Leicester University, uh, Sally Horrocks, uh, the advisory panel who have guided us through this project, chaired by Georgina Ferry, uh, who's here tonight, and I think other members of the panel are here too. But that's enough from me. Uh, you've come here to hear our extremely distinguished panel um, with, uh, uh, in the chair, I'm delighted to say, someone who has spent her life crossing disciplines and bringing disciplines together uh, within science, particularly physics and chemistry. Um, the professor of polymer science at Imperial, um, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, both from her work uh, at the cutting edge of research, but also thinking about that human element of science, particularly her work uh, as chair of Athena, uh, thinking about the role of women in science. Um, so it remains for me to only introduce your chair for this evening, Professor Dame Julia Higgins. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> well, 
Well, several of us on the stage here already knew each other, but we didn't all know each other, and we spent an hour or two before this meeting getting to know each other, and also considering how we are going to tackle this question of luck, serendipity, eureka, or whatever. And we've, we've structured the discussion a little bit, because on the whole, you'd find it a bit worrying if we just had a free-for-all up here. So we're going to start with luck in scientific careers, which is fairly straightforward in the sense that one can point a finger and say, well, if I hadn't been there then and met X, I wouldn't have made that choice, I wouldn't have had that career. But it gives a chance for each of us on the stage to tell you a little bit about ourselves and where we've come from. And nobody on the stage knows which order I'm going to approach them in. I'm just going to ask them to start by giving a very short introduction to themselves, rather than me doing each one, and then to tell you some point about their career where, in the storytelling mode, you, they would say luck or serendipity featured. And I'm going to start with Cyril, if you wouldn't mind, Cyril, please. Cyril Hilson. I think you were starting with me because I'm different. Um, I'm not an academic. I, I was, did have a physics degree. Uh, I was interviewed by Harry Hoff and uh, G.P. Snow, C.P. Snow, in uh, at some many years ago, and they decided that uh, I had to go and work for the government at a government laboratory. So eventually, I finished up at headquarters in the Admiralty and migrated to various government laboratories and finished up at the Royal Radar Establishment where I worked on various things. I had worked on infrared and solid state physics and semiconductors and microwave devices and lots of things. And then, in a way I'll explain to you later, I got involved in flat panel displays and it resulted in liquid crystal television, which I will tell you about. And then when I was 57, I decided I wanted a change because I was offered a job in industry who said I'd really been rather nasty to them for many years and maybe it was about time I came on the other side and uh, I could be nasty to the government. So I changed and worked for the General Electric Company, which as you know no longer exists, and became director of research and stayed there until they got embarrassed because the HMRC were interested because I was getting both a pension and a salary. And uh, they turfed me out uh, when I was 70-something or other. And since then, I've just been a general research advisor. Is that all right? That's fine. But where's the luck piece? You're going to tell us a story about luck in your career. Oh, I'll tell you that later. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Bailey. Uh, Mike Bailey. I'm a um, dendrochronologist, which is a sort of scientific archaeologist. And... Um, uh, I had a very checkered school career because uh, it was always other people's information and I wasn't that interested in it. But in the old grammar school system, you couldn't help but pick up a fair amount of uh, qualification. So I found myself in university doing a physics degree. And after three years of that, I discovered archaeology. Uh, so I finished the physics degree and was lucky enough that they were just thinking of starting to look into the possibility of building a tree ring chronology to calibrate radiocarbon. And uh, so I, I lucked out with a half-time, 500 pounds a year research assistant job. And after two years of that, we knew tree rings were going to work. In other words, we were going to be able to build a long chronology. And just then, the Institute of Irish Studies in Belfast produced some junior fellowships, um, which were to allow people to finish their PhDs. Now, I actually hadn't started a PhD. I was sort of loosely registered for a master's. But I immediately applied, and tree rings are such a wonderfully user-friendly subject that I blagged my way into a junior fellowship. Three years later, I had a PhD, one of the very first PhDs in archaeology in Ireland. Um, and I stuck it on the shelf thinking, if anybody ever wants to do that again, i.e. how to build a tree ring chronology, lift my thesis down and use it. But serendipity being what it was, uh, one of my academic colleagues uh, was moved from our department to another department. Uh, we never understood why. And it freed up a job, which I was lucky enough to get. And the result was I ended up as something I'd never expected, which was I was on the track for an academic career. 
and I was involved in building one of the world's, in fact, two of the world's longest tree ring chronologies, which of course underpins the radiocarbon calibration which is used internationally. So that's when I became rich and famous. Well, <laughs> as rich and famous as any academic in Britain ever becomes. So uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Now Charlotte has a different background. Charlotte is an historian of science. Um, so her background is, is different, but she's going to interject in our discussions, not only from her own career, but also from the point of view of what has happened to scientists historically. So, Charlotte, over to you. Your, your own and some examples of lucky scientists. Thank you very much. Well, I'm English, as you can hear from my voice, so I have less luck than the Irish. Um, and I'm hoping that we can find a scientific proof of that phenomenon by the end of the evening. I set off to university um, determined to be a zoologist or an evolutionary biologist. And it depends whether you want to tell the stories good luck or bad luck. Uh, I was lucky enough um, to have some not particularly inspiring teaching, but uh, also lucky enough to encounter a subject called history of science whilst I was there. And uh, I never looked back from that. So now um, I work at the University of Kent, where I get to teach the history of science, but to indulge my ongoing uh, passion for science by teaching science communication there as well, where we have a master's program. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about myself, as Julia says. I'm here to talk a little bit about scientists historically. Um, so it depends how many stories you want from me to begin with. I'll give you... Um, perhaps the, the most curious one, which has, both has extraordinary luck and the most extraordinary unluck in it. And that's the, um, the life story of Carl von Frisch, whom I'm sure you know um, from the famous experiments that he did on the dancing bees, where he discovered that the figure of eight... in the 1930s, indulging his passion for bees, when, of course, the Nazi regime started up. Uh, and at this point, it was dug up. I think it was one of his grandparents was Jewish, uh, which was uh, potentially extremely unlucky, not just for his scientific career, but even potentially for his life. And then another stroke of ill luck, uh, the Varroa virus uh, massively... Um, decimated the bee population in Europe. But he was able to turn these two pieces of bad luck into good luck. And he was able to make a case um, to the Nazi regime to say that um, bees equal pollination, pollination equals food, food equals vital resource for a nation at war. And he was able to argue what you need is a bee specialist. So he was able to save both his life and his career doing something that he wasn't really very interested in with relation to bees. He just wanted to do the wiggle stuff. Uh, but it's the most amazing story. And, and if you go through the story slowly, you see all these uh, awful Kafkaesque back and forths as it seems he's going to get the paperwork, not get it, get it, not get it, and as he manages to advance this story. So it's one of the most powerful stories I know about luck in science. Thank you. Chris. Well, good evening, everybody. I don't know about ideas in the Bath, but I grew up in Bath, so I guess that's my sort of entry point. Um, I, I've had a slightly unusual scientific career in that I've zigzagged about quite a lot. Um, I've always been very curious about lots of different things, and so I've tended to be tempted to go from one place to another, having, I, I guess what I've always felt is that when my learning curve and what I'm delivering starts to flatten out, it's time to think about doing something else. So just thinking about the transitions in my career, I've, I've managed to come up with about a dozen, which is quite a lot. And I can tell you a story about luck at every one. None of them was planned. It was always a chance encounter, uh, you know, some being in the right place at the right time or whatever. And we had some discussion before we came in here about whether you make your own luck or whether you identify things that you retrospectively say were lucky or whatever. Um, but I thought I would just, just choose one example and I, so just to paint in a little bit, I, I started my university career as a physicist. 
Um, I'd always been interested in astronomy, and in the days before mix and match courses were possible, it turned out five of us were able to do astronomy um, at Oxford, and that led to my going to Jodrell Bank as a radio astronomer, then University College London as an X-ray astronomer, and X-ray astronomy at the time was a completely new field. If you could get your instrument to survive the very rough journey up above the atmosphere, then you would almost certainly get a publishable result. So I'd been doing that for a little while, and, it had, and a little bit later we'll talk about uh, more detail of luck. It had led me into a big American project um, where I lived in the States for a while to study the sun and to study X-ray emissions from the sun. And uh, solar physicists come in two flavors, quiet sun people and active sun people, and they lead their academic lives on an 11-year cycle out of phase, five years out of phase, or five and a half years out of phase. So I was an active sun person, and we uh, ran a project called the Solar Maximum. And the great expectation from the solar uh, community was that I would then engage in the next 11-year cycle and be involved in the next satellite. Um, but I seem to be hissing a bit. Um, but I, I, I was interested in other things. And so this is a, t a story of two Johns. A John Vesesky from Stanford, who I just knew, uh, turned up uh, to listen to some results from the uh, uh, solar observatory and said, um, sort of, Psst, have you seen this? Um, and they were results from an American satellite where the instruments were looking the other way down at the Earth. And I thought, you know, that's just as indulgent and interesting, and it might even be really useful, too, to study how the Earth works from space rather than to study the great mysteries of the universe, however fascinating they are. And so the second piece of luck was that I called Robert Boyd, who is the director of Mullard Space Science Lab that I was going back to, and said, I've had this idea, you know, that we don't do Earth observation at present, but do you think it would be something that we should do? And he said, well, it's really interesting you should say that, because I was just thinking last week that it's about time we diversified and started doing this. So if you want to pick it up, go ahead and do it. So I came back to the UK, and we started to work on a project. And somebody from the Rutherford lab turned up and said, uh, we're desperate for help in a completely new area. Um, and would you be willing to um, take it on? So I went to Robert Boyd and said, look, I'm completely saturated. I've still got my solar work that I'm trying to finish off. I've got this other new stuff. I don't think I can possibly handle it. And he looked at me and said, uh, I'm sure you can, Chris. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm busy. I'm going to do something else. So when your director says that he's sure you can, you sort of say, oh, well, maybe I can. From that came the European Space Agency's series of polar radar missions and most recently, Cryosat, and from Cryosat, the first ability of humanity to measure uh, sea ice volume in the Arctic, which has revealed the massive sort of death spiral of ice in the Arctic, something which is absolutely fundamental in our understanding of how the way the planet is responding to human carbon emissions and, uh, and the phenomenon of human-induced global warming. Now. I, I, honestly, I, you know, it may be that somebody else would have done it. It may have happened anyway. But I can trace the heritage of, of these hugely important results now to that moment when Robert said, look, I'm really busy, Chris. I'm sure you can handle it, much as I felt I couldn't. And I think that was quite lucky for everybody. And when we get on a little bit later, we'll, we'll spread out from examples, the stories, to a more philosophical discussion of, well, is it luck or is it actually taking your luck and seeing opportunities? And also the question of when do you write about luck? If we were writing Chris's obituary, we wouldn't say he was dead lucky. We would say he was absolutely brilliant at choosing that particular move. So he's allowed to talk about luck, but if we were writing about him, we probably wouldn't talk about luck. And there's, there's a whole story in there. Just, just to complete the set of us, I have several points in my career where I apparently stepped sideways, moved, moved fields, most of them due to pieces of luck. Um, the first was when I was at Oxford, I'd, I'd read physics, as I think we all have, actually. Quite extraordinary. And um, I hadn't studied chemistry since I was 15 because I absolutely detested chemistry at school. However, at the end of my Oxford undergraduate degree, I wanted to do a PhD, and as most physics undergraduates did then, I wanted to do a PhD 
in elementary particles. It wasn't the Higgs boson there, it was something else, it was the so-called omega meson. Um, but there wasn't a place for me to study, to, to get a PhD grant to do elementary particle physics. However, my tutor had a young friend in his college who was just looking for his first PhD student. He was a chemist, but he wanted a physicist because he wanted to tackle the use of neutrons as a probe for studying things. And he didn't think chemists would be able to cope with neutrons, but he thought physicists might cope with neutrons. So I was offered this chance to do a PhD in a chemistry department with a serious lack in my chemistry knowledge in a new technique, neutron scattering. And I took it. It was the best decision I ever made because I do not think that I would have had a very long career in elementary particles, although who knows, I might have been one of the team of thousands that was working on the Higgs boson in the last few years, but I doubt it. But actually, it opened a completely new career to me, and it was just the chance of my tutor knowing this guy and this guy thinking, well, maybe a physicist will do. So that was my piece of luck at the beginning of my career. Having introduced ourselves to you a little bit and with these stories of careers, we thought we would then pick up some stories of luck in the research field itself, something that happened when we were doing our research. Um, Mike, would you like to start us with a story? <laughs> um, I've taken the liberty of leaving a hand out so you can all read ten examples of what I class as luck or serendipity. Um, but the one uh, which is going to become most famous if it's not already, is that um, when you're building a tree ring chronology, which we were for the first time in, in uh, the British Isles, uh, you've got overlapping patterns of rings from the present day, anchored at the present, year by year, all the way back for, in our case, some thousands of years. And we got back to the 10th century BC, and before the 10th century BC, we had another long floating chronology, year by year, but not tied down in time. and. Uh, we could not, no matter how many samples we got from different bogs, we could not find anything to bridge across this gap in the 10th century. Um, this was back about 1980, and there was a meeting in Durham. And at that time, to get to Durham from Belfast was an extremely expensive undertaking. So it was cheaper to fly to London and take the train north. It certainly wouldn't be now, but it was then. So I was sitting on the, on the western side of the train, looking out the window, passing mile after mile of what I took to be the North York Moors, and suddenly we passed a couple of fields. And sitting in the middle of one of the fields was a pile of bog oaks. These are the naturally preserved trees which have been pulled out by farmers, um, which we were very used to from all the work we were doing in Ireland. And I consciously thought, well, no one will ever find those because it appeared to be in the middle of nowhere. Um, as I say in the, in the handout, and retrospectively, it's almost like I challenged the universe because I said, no one will ever find those. And immediately, we passed the big blue signpost, the junction of the A1M and the A689, which is as nice a grid reference as you'll ever have. So three months later, two of us shared a field trip because there was no money in academia at that stage. Um, he wanted to look at Saxon churches. We went to the farmer who owned the fields. He said, go ahead, help yourselves. We took uh, 20 samples of these bog oaks. We had no idea what age they would be, so they could be any age. Uh, when we took them back to Belfast, David Brown, who's one of my assistants, he built a chronology and it ran from 381 BC to 1155 BC and bridged the 10th century, which was like, oh, no, that's lucky. Um, but what was slightly uncanny about it was when we linked these two chronologies together, the gap between them was one year. And that's when you start going, look, somebody's doing this. <laughs> you know, that, that, this is not just luck. This is like becoming borderline bizarre. So there you had a, an example of what I regard as blatant serendipity. You, you, you're sitting, remember, if I'd been sitting on the other side of the train, I wouldn't have seen them. And we would still, to this day, never have bridged that gap in the Irish chronology. We would have got round it another way by going to German colleagues and doing some sort of distant stepwise correlation, but that we didn't want to have to do that uh, from scientific reasons because we wanted to use the German chronologies as ultimate replication of our own chronology. So that's one of quite a number of these things that turned up. 
uh, I, I actually wrote more than is on that script, but I edited some of it out because it was becoming needlessly metaphysical. Um, uh, you sort of got the sense as this chronology was coming together, there were so many bits of luck that it's as if there was an intention. This is how it felt, as if there was an intention that this chronology should be built, which is an interesting thing for a scientist to, stay, to say. Thanks. Chris, you have a... I'm sure you've got many stories about yeah, that. I, I've got many stories. I'm not sure I've got anything quite as um, kind of extraordinarily... I think I'm coming and going. Here we are. I think you can hear me now. Um, I've, I've got a combination of, of bad luck and good luck. Um, in, in the early days of rocketry in, in the 70s, um, it was quite commonplace for your rocket to fail for one reason or another. Sometimes your equipment failed. Sometimes the rocket system failed. And uh, my um, bad experience was that after having had a year's funding to do radio astronomy at Jodrell Bank, and one and a bit years into my funding of the remaining two years to do a PhD on X-ray astronomy, um, the rocket that we launched from Woomera uh, didn't work, or at least my part of it didn't work. And so I and that looked like the end of you know the end of my career. Um, anyway, Robert Boyd, who who ran the lab, was sort of used to these things happening. When I got back, he called me in and he said things must be looking pretty black. And I said, yes, they are. And he said, well, he said, I've got three bits of good news for you. Firstly, I found you another year's funding. Um, and uh, secondly, he said, um, I'm, uh, I recognize that if you're not pushing the limits uh, and taking these risks, you're probably not doing anything very useful. So, um, you know, the fact that it failed was a, was a shame, but you shouldn't take it too personally. He said, the third bit of advice is that if I were you, I don't know if you know that the Mullard Space Science Lab is in an old country house, Homebury House, at the bottom of Homebury Hill in the Surrey Wolds. And it's quite commonplace for us at the lunchtime to walk up to the cairn at the top. He said, I suggest you go up and sit up on that cairn on your own and reflect carefully about what you might have done that might have caused this not to happen so that in future you might at least avoid that mistake. He said, I'm, I forgive one mistake. I don't forgive the same mistake a second time. So I went away and thought about this, and I thought, you know, um, there are lots of things I could do, and in fact, my second rocket, I claim, could have been hit by a nuclear weapon, and I would have had publishable results, and, and that was hugely successful. But it seemed that I needed a second string to my bow, so I went back, to the, I went up to the cairn, wandered back, and when I went back into the lab, I happened to see my supervisor, and he said to me as I was passing him, oh, have you seen this publication by Borkowski and Kopp? He said, it's about position-sensitive X-ray detectors. He said, I've no idea what we would use them for, but it looks interesting. And so I sat down and read it, and it turned out that the experience that I'd had previously at Jodrell Bank allowed me to understand the electronics. And so as a side string, I developed one-dimensional position-sensitive X-ray detectors, which it turned out allowed you for the first time ever to um, uh, diffuse a, um, an X-ray spectrum and measure it uh, continuously rather than to rock a crystal across a spectrum, which allowed you to study diagnostically the things going on in solar flares, which change in their intensity very rapidly, which led to the reason why I was working on this huge uh, solar maximum emission. So again, an extraordinary combination of luck and then development um, that allowed this dispersion of, of X-rays into the detector and allowed us to do completely new science on solar X-rays. So. Uh, just another example. There are lots. Charlotte, how about some historical examples? There are so many to choose from. It's one of the favorite stories, I think, that we have to tell about science, the idea that there was just this lucky moment where, where everything turned around. So, you know, I'm pretty, I, we could probably go around the room and everyone would be able to, to think of one. Newton's apple, you know, gravity. Um, probably completely untrue. Doesn't matter. It's a great story. Um, uh, another one that I know quite well has to do with Galvani. Uh, and there's a few different versions of this story. Uh, so it's the story of how he supposedly discovered the electrical nature of nervous impulses. And there's some combination of frogs, thunderstorms, electricity, um, frog cooking, basically. That's, that's the bottom line of the story. Whether it was Mrs. Galvani doing it or in my personal favorite 
version, she was ill in bed and he was doing the cooking. There's an important lesson about science and gender. Um, anyway, there was a thunderstorm going and lo and behold, the legs started twitching. Uh, the idea was so. And also, um, almost certainly or significantly complete rubbish. Uh, for one thing, he'd already kind of had a very good idea about how this phenomenon might, might work from, from things that other people had written, other experiments people had done. And secondly, um, I don't know if you've ever done dissection. Uh, I guess the physicists haven't. Um, it's really, really hard. It's certainly not the same as chopping things up for the pot to get that nerve exactly exposed to make it work. That's really fiddly business. Uh, I'll just give you one more, and that website's where you can find these things. Um, Alexander Fleming. Uh, and, and another little moral lesson for us, a very bad housekeeper, a uh, very bad lab keeper. Uh, he let things get into a terrible mess. So he went off on holiday. Shall I tidy up? No, I'll just leave it. Um, so he left his bacterial cultures where they were, went off wherever it was that he went, um, came back a couple of weeks later and discovered... Um, uh, a mold growing on, on one of the plates that seemed to have inhibited the bacterial growth. And that mold turned out to be penicillin. Well, that was not, certainly not complete rubbish, but again, there's a lot more to that story than meets the eye. Um, Louis Pasteur once said that chance uh, favours the prepared mind, or chance in observations favours the prepared mind. And Fleming had already been working on antibacterial agents. Um, in the example of lysosomes. So he was very much primed uh, to be looking for that kind of activity. Um, and also, it, it wouldn't be fair to say that it was a chance discovery of penicillin as we know it, because it didn't occur to him that it could be a systemic medicine. Um, he was only interested in it as a, a sort of a topical agent. So again, it took others to, to kind of work that fully through to, to the state where we have it today. So there are so many of these examples uh, in science. But as a historian of science, what really interests me is not so much whether they're true or not, or to what extent they're true or not. What interests me is why do we like to tell this kind of a story about science? What, what do we get out of it? And uh, I think at different times and in different places, we use these stories for different reasons. If you look in the early 19th century, for example, the very early 19th century, they knew that that Newton story was rubbish. But they still told it, because um, not because they wanted to say the universe made him lucky, but as an inspiration for other people to be ingenious and to think around the situations that presented themselves. So that's, that's kind of an interesting take on it. I think the way that we use those stories today is, is, is sort of different. Um, it, makes, it makes us sound very humble, I think, if we say that we just were lucky. It wasn't my skill. It's a very un-English thing to say, I think, to say, uh, you know, you know I, I got this through my, my brilliance. Uh, and so we, it's, it's a way of, of sounding quite humble. But in a subtle kind of way, flip it on its head, and it's, a, it's almost the very opposite of being humble. If you, certainly if you say it about somebody else, it sort of says, well, the universe favoured them somehow. So it's kind of almost like a secular myth of, of divine favour, I think. So they're all... I could, I could go on and on, but I, I think the way we use these stories is what's really interesting. Cyril, is this where the television comes in? Probably. I'm sure that most of you have seen liquid crystal television. I want to tell you how it happened. And you can see yourself pick out places where you think luck came in. It starts 50 years ago, in 1963, when Harold Wilson at the Labour Party conference said, when our party gets into power, we will start a white hot technological revolution. Nobody quite knew what it meant, but it sounded quite good. And the party did get into power the next year, and they formed the Ministry of Technology, which was meant to start this going. And in 1967, that ministry took over the defence laboratory where I worked, the Royal Radar Establishment, which obviously was working on radar. 
but still we were in a new ministry. And our director was a mathematician called George McFarlane, later Sir George McFarlane. And the Minister of Technology arranged to visit us early in 1967. His name was John Stonehouse. Some of you may remember it. He became notorious later on for reasons which we will not go into. Anyway, John visited and George discussed with him and they talked about how the UK did not benefit from its inventions. Nothing new under the sun, you see. And George made a statement, the accuracy of which I am not certain now, though he had said that I gave it to him. It was that the UK was spending more on royalties to the US on the color television tube that was being used at that time than we were spending on Concord. Anyway, that impressed the minister, and he went away, and the next day rang up George and said, Director, you have convinced me. And George, being a good politician as well as an excellent mathematician, said, Excellent, excellent minister. What exactly did I convince you on? He said, Why? He said, the need for us to develop a flat panel television tube. And he said, oh yes, of course, I remember now. Yes, he said. And the minister said, so I want you to start a program straight away. Well, George immediately got on the phone and uh, rang the director, the uh, physics department head, David Parkinson, and me. At that time, I had the position in the laboratory, which was called Individual Special Merit, which didn't mean very much. It meant I could get up to a senior rank without having administrative responsibilities. So we toddled down to see George and said, what's going on? So he explained that the minister had been in, in touch, and he said, uh, what can we do to develop a flat panel television? David Parkinson went white, and I said nothing. They both agreed this was not a good enough answer for the minister. So David had the bright idea. He said, tell him we will set up a working party. <laughs> Seemed reasonable. So we set up a working party with David as chairman. Before long, David, sensible person, got promoted to headquarters and came in and threw a file on my desk and said, it's all yours now. So I inherited this working party. And I had recruited, well, David had recruited with me, people who knew a lot about materials, and we sat and pontifically developed what we thought was going to be a program. And one of the things we thought about was liquid crystals. Liquid crystals was a material which people had started thinking about, but it was proving extremely difficult. And I thought we had to consider this. So... We organized a meeting. The headquarters people arranged for us to meet in London, and we got more or less everybody in the UK who knew what the words liquid crystals meant. There were about 23 of them. And I was chairing this meeting, and the UK authority on liquid crystals gave a, quite a nice talk on what liquid crystals could do. And then he stopped, and of course it was question time. I, as chairman, asked for questions, and of course, as always happens, nobody wanted to ask any questions, so the chairman has to do something. So in desperation, I said, now you've put the liquid crystal down next to the slide projector. Notice, at that time, we had slide projectors. And it's casting a very curious pattern on the screen, which is fluctuating and moving. Why? And the authority said, ah, excellent question, excellent question. Now let me explain. The reason for this is, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not that at all. What it is is, no, it's not that either. Um, it's in my notes. It's in my notes. I've got it here. And he started fumbling through his pile of papers and books that he had on the, on the lectern and then knocked them all on the floor. And then he bent down and was fumbling with them, muttering, I've got it here somewhere, I've got it here somewhere. 
Well, obviously, now this is a critical point in the development of liquid crystal television. You may not appreciate that, but I can assure you that it is, because he was fumbling on the floor and the meeting was getting out of my control. And I didn't quite know what to do when suddenly a quiet voice from the back said, I wonder if I can help. And I looked up and said to the gentleman, I'd be really obliged if you would. And he proceeded to give a very succinct explanation of what was being seen on the screen. Meanwhile, the UK authority was still fumbling on the floor. <laughs> I sort of nudged him with my knee. Other people say I kicked him, but I deny that. I nudged him with my knee and said, it's all right, it's all right, we know it now. I don't remember quite what happened later on with the other talks and things, but the, the headquarters secretary came up to me afterwards and said, have you decided on anything? I said, yes, put the man from Hull on a contract. That was how I met George Gray, and we'll mention him again in a minute. Well, the working party... I said put him on a contract. We hadn't got a program, of course. The working party hadn't finished. But still, I knew this was a man that we ought to actually recruit. So we carried on, the working party carried on, and after two years after Stonehouse had visited and Stonehouse had moved on by then, we actually had a report, which my secretary typed up, and I took it home to read in my garden. And it was a nice sunny afternoon on Saturday and I was sitting there reading this. And I felt uncomfortable. I read that what we had agreed on after two years was a program in which we would emphasize ferroelectric ceramics. Is there anyone in the audience who's <laughs> heard of ferroelectric ceramics? Well, then it was the buzzword. And we were going to do it as a saving measure in case that didn't work, we were going to have a small program on liquid crystals. I read the report, and I didn't like it. There was something wrong. The logic didn't lead to the conclusions. So I thought, I don't know. And I started doodling. And wherever it said ferroelectric ceramics, I doodled in liquid crystals. Wherever it said liquid crystals, I put ferroelectric ceramics. So I looked at it the next day and thought, yes, that looks right. That looks right. So I took it back to the working party who were furious. But they were worn out. So that was what we agreed on. Right. Now, at that time, liquid crystals were in a terrible state throughout the world. People had been interested. It was a bandwagon they'd got on and all the wheels were coming off. People made devices from it, and they lasted for two weeks at most. They were dying. So everyone thought we must move on to something else, but we couldn't. So we now started a program with George Gray at Hull University. He worked for two years, and after that came up with a new chemical family, which is the one that was used in television sets for 30 years. He was alone in, well, alone. He had a group and he worked with our group at uh, Morgan. And as a result, it was not only the basis for liquid crystal television, but with what we had done at Morgan, we were able to get royalties and bring in a hundred million pounds to the UK t uh, Treasury. Now, what happened to George? George was a lecturer at the time of our meeting in Hull University and he was depressed because he had put in a program to the research council which they rejected on the grounds there wasn't sufficient research in it. George went on to become a fellow of the Royal Society and to win the Kyoto Prize for Technology. There isn't a Nobel Prize for Technology, the Kyoto Prize is the nearest thing and he won £350,000 for that. He went on, as I say, a great success. And you have seen the results of this. The contract we gave to George at the beginning was £1,400 a year. Luck? I don't know. Oh, by the way, we, we never got permission to start the programme. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, the story of liquid crystals is an amazing one, isn't it? It amazes me when I was teaching um, in the first year university students how few have asked how the thing works. I mean, you'd think curiosity would say, how do these displays work? And very few of them had ever asked the question. Depressed me, that. But that's... Uh, any more stories on the history? Have I asked everybody? I think I think I have. Luck in, luck in science. You? Well, um, several places, but I'll, I'll tell the same story I told you. Um, we were doing neutron scattering, it, and you don't need to know much about it, but you use the, the neutrons in a reactor, and you use them as a beam like you might use x-rays. If you want to do that, you want to put deuterium where hydrogen would normally be in your sample, and you need a chemist to do it for you. And we were wanting to look at plastic materials, which have a lot of hydrogen, so it's potentially quite possible to change the hydrogen for deuterium, and then we could do the scattering experiments. But the experiment I wanted to do, and my group wanted to do, we thought we knew what the best material to do this was, and we couldn't get, the chemists couldn't put the deuterium in for us. They, they, fail, they failed to deuterate it, um, and so we chose a different material. Our rivals, I should say, but they're certainly colleagues, but to some extent rivals in Germany in a different laboratory managed to make the first material, the one we thought was going to be the best. Turned out it wasn't the best at all. The one that we were forced to use because it was what our chemists could make for us turned out to be much better in terms of the range of energy and the range, the spatial range that you could explore using that material. So it was a piece of luck that came out of effectively bad luck. We didn't think we were going to be able to do the experiment. And I think that, that quite often happens that bad luck, um, as it were, turns around. Heaven knows what would have happened if you stuck with, what did you say, ferric ceramics? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would all have collapsed. Yeah. Um, we've got time <laughs> for some more stories here oh. before we open it up. Charlotte? I was, I was wondering, are there, are there times and places where it's a appropriate to talk about luck and others where it's not? And the reason I, I asked this question, we've got, um, we've got a science arts program running at Kent at the moment, uh, and we've got a postdoc who's been, who's been embedded uh, with the scientists in, in, in our biosciences department. Um, and he's been working with a scientist who's working on RNA. And um, on top of her thermocycler, her PCR machine, uh, she's got the lucky giraffe. And they have to touch the lucky giraffe before they set the process going. They also have the lucky cloning rabbit. Uh, and if they see, we, you need to know the University of Kent's got a lot of rabbits bouncing around on the grass. Uh, and if they see the lucky cloning rabbit on the way to work in the morning, they reckon it's going to be a lucky, a lucky experiment. Now, don't, just, don't tell anybody I told you that, because I think they'd be fantastically embarrassed. Very much an in-joke, and only because we've got this postdoc embedded that this uh, dirty fact has emerged, which none of you know. It's our secret. Um, so I, I, I don't think that anyone will ever know that, but it's kind of okay to talk about luck afterwards or in some contexts. What, what do you think? Certainly, um, <clears throat> I would be rather different from the other hard scientists here because I talk or write for a much more informal uh, arts-based audience half the time. So um, if we were saying this earlier in the discussion, if you're writing a paper for nature, there's really no place to put in comments like, gosh, we got really lucky to find this out. I mean, the, the editor would take it out if you don't take it out yourself. Um, but if you're writing a popular a conference proceedings, for example, a fesh rift, stuff where you can be much more relaxed, or indeed if you're writing a general book, then you can go in and draw out, like that example I gave you about the swan car chronology linking across uh, 948 BC. Uh, that, that's the sort of thing you can lay out for people. And people, readership, by and large, do like that. But you can't always do it. And then one of the other things we were talking about is if you're working with a large group of scientists, it's very unlikely that that sort of phraseology would ever come out of a report. So you don't hear about the bits of luck. Whereas a lone scholar uh, who is probably much more impressed by a lucky break when it happens is more likely to actually record it and tell you about it. 
So there, there are issues of that sort. Um, how often does it actually leak out? I mean, have any of the rest of you ever said in a publication this this was a very lucky thing? Oh yes. Oh, you have. Oh, right. <laughs> have to because very often it is. But there's a mixture of luck and intuition, isn't there? I mean, you always have alternative ways forward. I mean, you're progressing forward. There are a number of alternatives. And sometimes you can view it as a lottery. But other times you think, well, I think we should go that way. And somebody says, why? And you say, well, I don't know. I just think you should go that way. That liquid crystal one was a good example. When you analyze it later, maybe 40 years later, you can understand why in building you was the arrows that showed you which way you should go. But you didn't necessarily appreciate it, nor could you explain it. So when somebody says afterwards, well, what made you do that? You say, well, I suppose it was just lucky. And it was, of course, because you thought you would exploit that opportunity. And the opportunity occurred because it was a bit lucky. Chris, yeah, sure. I, just, I, I, I think what we're sort of touching on here is that um, scientists suffer from the, the sort of hubris and, and, and others... It's like that character, Mr. Spock from Star Trek, you know, where scientists try and promulgate this idea that they're very impartial, careful, you know, balanced thinkers. In fact, science is a hugely creative process, and, and, and the people involved are very passionate people. You know, they're, they're awake at four o'clock in the morning, you know, puzzling over, over things. And so I like the lucky cloning rabbit, because what you've reminded me of is in those days when you would work for 18 months, uh, to get an experiment ready to launch into space, and you knew that the statistics were quite poor, you know, maybe 50-50 chance that you, this was going to work. And, and I saw, you know, hardened colleagues dashing back to their quarters to get their lucky shirt uh, just before the launch. And you'd look at them and say, you don't believe in that. They go, oh, no, 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 but luckily it works anyway, you know. <laughs> So I, I, I just think it, it makes science a much more human and personal thing. You know, pe people would, you know, touch wood, they, they, they go through all the human things because science is just a fascinating, curious thing, but they're just people. And, and it, it goes a step further than that. There's a sort of assumption that, that science moves in straight lines, you know, and that you could all see where you were going. And all the stories we've heard both before this session and here, tell exactly the opposite story, that it was a chance zigzag this way or that that ended up with something that you can rationalize afterwards, um, but just was a, a, a set of circumstances coming together, which always leaves me wondering, well, what else might have happened, you know, had there been a different set of circumstances? It just shows that science is, is sitting in a very rich milieu. And, and it's just those combinations that make progress. You were talking earlier, Chris, uh, about the, the serendipity, or in fact the design serendipity of putting together people with a background in physics, in geography, possibly in literature even, and, and, and what happens then? I think that's, that, that's making luck by seeing what sparks are going to happen. I, I've always been very interested in um, interdisciplinary research. Um, you know, it's the old joke about the, the um, kind of rational punter in science uh, spending their entire career rewriting their PhD and becoming a greater and greater expert on less and less because obviously a big fish in a small pool is more likely to get their publications published. Um, and, and so there is a tendency, not just in science, for people to become very siloed, you know, small tribes of people who know each other and work with each other and, don't, uh, and who, who develop an arcane language to talk with each other efficiently that excludes them from talking to other people. So I've always been interested in, in what happens when you get um, people with not only different specializations, but it turns out different ways of thinking. You know, a, a geographer who thinks taxonomically thinks very differently from a physicist or mathematician addressing the same issue. So what I've seen happen and what I've tried to make happen is to draw together groups of people who have different backgrounds, different expertise, different baggage, but different things to bring to the party, and then have a safe space in which they can 
um, uh, spark off each other to try and solve problems. And, and you see things happen under those circumstances which you know could not have happened without them being brought together because it's one idea that sparks another that starts something else off and out of it emerges something new and creative. So that business of silo busting and, um, and bringing together people with completely different viewpoints is hugely uh, creative and beneficial. I mean, people, to me, you, you've also touched a spark there. People think of the scientists sitting there thinking and the possible eureka moment. You see, for me, it's always seeing patterns. I'm looking for patterns in data or something that I think will make the story come together. Um, but actually, one of some of the most exciting moments are when there are two or three people around, and they might actually be from the same discipline, not necessarily different disciplines, and you're talking and you're putting things, drawing pictures on the blackboard, and something comes out of it. And it's, it's an extraordinarily exciting moment. And it, that's not luck. It's, it's putting all the ideas there and seeing what happens. But, but, but quite, quite often, at the end of a session like that, everybody thinks that whatever it was was their idea. <laughs> Which is great, because they're committed to it. But, yeah. uh, Do you have any more stories about luck? Well, or yeah, I think um, I'll tell you about a, a, maybe a context for the, for the luck stories that we've told in the last generation or, or generation and a half. <clears throat> um, uh, and the context is money. Um, because what do, what do scientists need to do their research? They need money and ideally not too many questions to be asked about how they're going to spend it so that they can do these creative things in terms of bringing people together, um, exercising those, those skills and understanding which people are going to work together. We don't often think, that, think of that as a, a quality of a good scientist, but, but I think it is. Um, in, uh, in 1971, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, um, there was a report commissioned, the Rothschild re Report, which said that, which limited um, the amount of money, effectively, that could go into funding pure science and said that uh, a proportion of it had to go to solve very direct applied science problems. And I think that after that happened and, and, and kind of the, the whole financial climate that that was a part of, and, and we still see that today, um, scientists started telling stories uh, about uh, the luck of pure science, uh, which was then... Um, developed as, as an applied science or a piece of technology that would not have come about were it not for that pure science. So it was a way you, of using those luck stories to say, guys, you can't shortcut the pure science. For goodness sake, don't take that money away um, because all these good things have luckily come out of it. Uh, and there are various examples that are given. Teflon is one of them. If you go to NASA's website, they actually um, disavow that story, that this was a product um, of the of the space program, so I think that's quite an interesting um, use that we have, perhaps as a as a profession as a whole, um, for for those luck stories. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking now at Cyril because actually, the, the idea that the basic research happens and then we progress forwards is, isn't on the whole the way a lot of this happens, is it? There, there's a there's a there's a much more to and fro between the basic and the applied. It seems to me. Well, you certainly do much better in applied science if you understand the underlying science. Uh, it doesn't always happen. I mean, the example I give is the old television tube, uh, which relied on getting electrons from a heated cathode. But the physics of that was never understood. And as a result, very often in those factories, it would stop working. And nobody knew why they were no longer making cathodes, but they were doing what they thought was exactly the same thing. Of course, they weren't. Uh, it, sometimes the original material was slightly different. But because they didn't understand exactly how it worked, and never did, they would have several days out from production when people would be tearing their hair out and trying different things. And if they were lucky, it came back. I mean, they tried so many things and there was so much involved that in the end they got it right. But it would have been much better if you understood what was going on. And when people started work on silicon chips, they made sure that they really did understand the underlying physics so that it took the risk out. And that often was the role of the government in things because industry doesn't like running risks. 
So we discovered many things because the government would fund the basic research going on in industry. In those days, most of the research was actually done in industry, not in academia. And government would fund the basic research, and then when it got to the stage where it was clear it was successful, then industry would take over and fund the development. And that's a pattern we don't have nowadays. Nowadays, we rely much more on academia to come up with invention. And that isn't terribly easy, and it leads to a lot of problems because often you discover that the luck has come to an individual, and then that individual gets paid by foreigners, basically, foreign institutions, to take the invention elsewhere. Though all of the funding has come from the UK. And this is a problem which we, we really haven't mastered as yet as to how we manage to get employment coming from our own luck or skill. Yeah. You can, you can t talk about luck, but essentially the skill comes in recognizing when you've been lucky and knowing how to exploit it. And not everybody has that facility. No, you require rather particular people to do that, and I'm not sure we're breeding them these days. Well, you need to have a deep knowledge of science. Mm. You, it does come out when you realize that something is right. Uh, you can say that it's lucky that you happen to come across it, but of course the person doing it has a, a collection of <laughs> facilities that have come from wide experience. Mike, you wanted to come in then. Yeah, you're sort of touching on an issue there that I was going to try and couch it as, is there such a thing as absolute luck? And the easiest way to think about this is through coincidences. Just about everyone comes across bizarre coincidences and you think, wow, that's, that's so fundamentally unlikely that there must be some rationale for that, there must be some meaning to it. But of course the scientists and statisticians tell you, ah, that's just because it looks significant to you, but everybody's dreaming, everybody's thinking, everybody's doing things, there are billions of us, so it's bound to happen to someone. I actually have a slight problem with that. I actually think maybe there, there are coincidences that actually are borderline insignificant. And if you take that as a model and then bring it back into luck, is, is it that luck isn't just explainable away as if enough people are beavering away and you put enough of them together, some good ideas will come up? Is there actually an absolute luck? I don't have an answer, by the way. I'm just saying, from the point of view of discussing it or thinking about it, is there something out there which just injects luck into the situation and then it's up to the individual or the group to recognize it and act on it? Um, I'd like to believe there was. Why? <laughs> well, otherwise we're just on a pebble going round the sun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. you do get a free trip round it every year, though. Yeah. They do. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be time to, to open this to questions or comments from the audience. Now, there are some microphones around, and so if you indicate to me that you'd like to say something, I will get the microphone to you. Don't attempt to do it without, because we, we, won't, we won't hear the question, or at least those of us who are more elderly won't hear the question or the comment. So if you wait for the microphone, and if you just say who you are, it's, it's quite useful. And can I remind you, by the way, that this is all being video because it will be podcast so you are launching into your public career if you ask <laughs> questions but don't let that put you off <laughs> but please keep questions and comments fairly brief because we've got about uh, up till eight o'clock we can go on doing that and then we want to move on to celebrating with some drinks and nibbles so who'd like to start anybody one down here there's a microphone just behind you You've all had uh, individual... Can you tell us who you are? My name's John Pugh. Thank you. Um, I was a biologist, so I'm different from the rest of you. Uh, you've all t told us about your individual experiences of luck or good luck, bad luck, and how sometimes it was a, a combination of circumstances, a combination of people. From that experience, 
how could you better design lab labs lab teams uh, lab circumstances to encourage the situation to happen more often it's a very good question cyril you want to start my best invention was a magnetic susceptibility meter which was licensed by a body called the National Research Development Corporation, who issued a sole license to a company called Electronic Instruments Enrichment, who never developed it because they were full up with making pH meters, which was proving very successful. That was bad luck in the way it was handled. But I learned from that, never give a sole license and when liquid crystals came on, we had two companies fighting each other for licenses. So you can say the first thing was good luck for the country. Um, let me just interject. I would say make sure there's a coffee room and allow people the time to go to it. Make them feel legitimate in going to have a cup of coffee and chatting over coffee. If you go to the Newton Institute in Cambridge, on every landing there is a coffee area, there's a whiteboard, and you see people sitting there discussing. If you go to CERN, if any, any, I don't know whether you've ever been to CERN, you will find people all over the place having cups of coffee and talking. So absolutely provide legitimate reasons to talk. You're not, you're not interested. Go yeah, ahead. Well, I, I may, go, may go one step further than that. When I, I took over a, a particular lab a few years ago, which had got into a rather stovepipe mode where the different um, disciplines fractionated out and spent their time at coffee talking to each other. And, and indeed, on my second day there, I sat amongst one set of ologists, and a young visiting different ologist came to sit with us, and an old hand, thinking he was being helpful, said, no, 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 the, the other ologists <laughs> sit over there. So I thought, right, OK. Um, and so we did a lot to encourage people to talk to each other, you know, this idea of interdisciplinary discussion. Well, and I don't care if it's football or whatever it is, it, things will happen. Um, but there was a lot of resistance to it. And so in the end, I had all of the seating ripped out of the coffee room so that people could no longer <laughs> fractionate into their traditional patterns and had circular tables put in. It was, it was um, very controversial and much disliked at the time. But in the end, the combination of measures just got people talking to each other. The other thing is, is to give people the confidence um, if you like, the top cover, to do what Robert Boyd did for me and, and say, make mistakes. You know, if you're not making mistakes, you're not pushing the limits. And I'm not interested in running a very boring, conservative, and uninteresting research lab. And, and, and just genuinely, you know, I would take time out and go and talk to all of the scientists, you know, with them and take an interest in what they're doing and encourage them. And in, interestingly, one of the things that happens as you get more experienced with just doing research, is that you can sort of see things. And even though you're not an ologist of whatever it is, you can often say, well, have you thought of doing something like this? Just just encourage that sort of, I don't know, electric effervescence, you know, just thinking out of the box. <coughs> uh, and, give pe and, and protect people. Protect people from the bureaucratic systems that are always trying to um, force people to go through very, very safe steps. And, and, and so, you know, the job of a, a, a senior team in a lab, I see as much to protect those who are in it and, and allow them to get on and follow their noses as to, uh, you know, to make sure that it delivers. Um, I'm just on the same oh, sure. point there. Yeah. I, and I, then I would, here. I wouldn't rule out um, uh, setting up a blog between yourselves in a laboratory situation and try and uh, make what you're putting out on the blog interesting enough to attract all those retired engineers and librarians who have infinite time on their hands and just love to give you ideas. And they're so unselfish, they will just fire stuff at you all the time. You can weed that out, of course, you know, but you might get some interesting ideas from it. It's not to be sneered at. And the way the blog sphere is going, I don't think there's any way back. We can't go back to our ivory towers. Um, and our, our quiet conferences. I mean, the, the world is now involved in everything you do. Can I just add one other thing that I meant to say, and that is allow the opportunity for the unconscious mind uh, to, to deliver its stuff. So um, I, I remember being very impressed by the stories of a, of a particular lab, you know, in the old days, 
where if they all got stuck on a problem, they'd all go off on a fishing trip. Well, you know, um, putting in your claim for a fishing trip to the research camps probably wouldn't go down too well these days. But we, 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 would, um, we would all go out for a walk at lunchtime and just walking in the fresh air and talking about things often allows the unconscious mind to, to solve problems and somebody will go, hey, I've just had this brilliant idea out of nowhere. Yes, you've been waiting patiently. Tell us who you are. Thank you. Thank you. My name's John Hunter. Sorry I was late. Um, a little while ago, Derry and Brown, the illusionists, did a program about luck, and there was supposed to be a lucky dog, um, a, a, a statue, and he put the thing around saying, if you touch the statue, you'll be lucky. And a lot of people touched the statue, and they were lucky. And he, the, the idea of the thing is that if you... His idea was that if you feel lucky, you're going to look for luck things, you're going to see the opportunities uh, because you're feeling lucky. And I'm wondering whether you feel that the scientists, whether that also applies to science ideas, that if you feel yourself lucky, you'll see the opportunities and you'll be able to bring the luck to you. I was just wondering what your ideas on that are. I, 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 I've been, uh, yeah, I started life as a physicist. I'm, I'm actually doing a lot of work on the psychology of climate dismissal right now, so I'm doing a lot of psychology. And, and it's absolutely fascinating how, you know, to learn how we make sense of the world around us. And as we're speaking, you know, part of our brain is, is, is attempting unconsciously to make sense of everything that's going on around us. And it's got certain programs that are very, very good. So we see faces in patterns in clouds, but we don't see clouds in faces. You know, there are certain things that are working all the time. And what, what seems to be the case is that if we can make sense of something, we will do it. And it's what astrologers earn their living on, isn't it? They write something suitably vague, and we go, oh, wait a minute, they said that I was going to win sixpence today or something, and I somebody gave me a penny extra in the change or something. So, you know, we pattern match. And uh, we were talking before we came in about the number of people you hear have escaped from extraordinary accidents. You know, I, I know somebody who uh, survived a plane crash. I know somebody who did something else. And of course, you, you don't hear about, from the people who didn't. Um, and, and so, so you, you know, you, 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 your view of the world is, is constantly being distorted by this pattern matching engine that is overworking at making sense of things. And I wonder if the effect that you just described wasn't astrological-like in the sense that you touch something and then your capacity to find something that could be associated with it just overworked. Um, because I think we're very good at that. It seems to be part of the way our brains work. And, and I think historically, um, those are the characters that you find creating a story about themselves that is, is persuasive to their public at the time and then goes on to be afterwards. The kind of that, maybe that level of, of self-belief and sort of self... Um, popularization. I absolutely agree with what you say. It's a good question because uh, in a sense it goes back to that business of making your own luck. If you're told that you're allowed to be lucky then maybe that frees you up to see those opportunities. In other words, it's a permission thing. Thanks, I'm Georgina Ferry. I'm on the uh, advisory board of the Oral History of British Science. Um, I just wondered whether, I mean, remembering back to my chemistry O level, experiments were presented as something that was very objective. There would be diagrams in a book of retorts and Bunsen burners and so on, but there weren't any people involved. Uh, but the way you've been talking, it sounds to me as though the experimenter or the group of experimenters are actually part of the initial conditions of the experiment. It, it, would you say that that's a, a reasonable way at looking at how, how science is done? Well, to some extent, the experimenter decides which experiment they're going to do. I mean, at school, you're told which experiment you are to do. You're also told the result they expect. If you actually got a result that they didn't expect, then they'll tell you you have made a mistake. I mean, I once had to measure the acceleration due to gravity in North Wales and came up with an answer that uh, 
was quite different from what was in the textbooks. But the physics lecturer refused to accept it. <laughs> there was also the possibility that it had actually changed just at the time I'd done the experiment. <laughs> but he refused to accept that. I, I think that's the, the, the point I was trying to make earlier, that, that we all tend to suffer from uh, assimilation bias. So if something comes out the way we expect when we do an experiment, we tend to move on. And if it comes out the way we didn't expect, then we tend to think, well, I must have twiddled the knobs wrong or something. And, and I've seen that in my own, I was aware of that in my own career. The thing about scientists is that they aspire to be as unbiased and impartial as they possibly can. And if they catch themselves slipping into assimilation bias, they try and do something about it. And indeed, a lot of science process, double-blind things, uh, are, are attempts to ensure that an inherent bias in the experimenter can be um, ruled out by the way that the experiment is devised. Now, I'm a, I'm a climate scientist. And as you know, climate science has become an extremely controversial issue. Um, and um, there are some climate scientists, or some people who claim to be climate scientists, who uh, publish, if you like, the contrarian view, the dismissive view. And, I'm, I'm, and, and some of those I have some respect for, and some of them I, I don't respect, because I don't respect um, their track record of the sort of things that they presented, which are often, if not deliberately misleading, unconsciously misleading. And so um, I had an occasion recently where a publication from somebody who I don't hold in high respect arrived on my desk, and somebody from a very, very distinguished UK climate scientist also arrived on my desk. And I sat there, and I consciously tried to apply the same skeptical degree of skepticism to the paper from the person who I respect and trust as to the one that I was trying to pick holes in because I really don't think that they're being very honest. Um, and, and so what I guess I'm saying is that we're all human, and we all tend to suffer from that bias. But at least the science community aspires to not suffer from that and is constantly fretting about it and trying to patrol it. Whereas you see in many other um, uh, parts of life, people who are simply cherry-picking information to satisfy their prejudices. And so that's, the, that's how you distinguish science from not science. There's a point here. Somebody, there's a microphone coming from this way. Hi, I'm Rachel Maggart, and um, I come from a completely different background, not scientific at all, but still creative. And um, I'm just wondering, because you're talking about this assimilation bias and the way which we talk about luck um, being something that we notice afterwards that would have led us to a scientific discovery. And this whole lecture, in fact, I was reminded of a book I read a few years ago called My Stroke of Insight. And it was a neuroscientist who wrote the book. And what happened is that she, she suffered a stroke, but maintain consciousness. And um, long story short, through seven years, came to these insights and realizations about our neurochemistry that she hadn't prior. And I just wonder, and this is a question for all of you, if you've ever suffered a stroke of insight that way or had some calamity or just an unfortunate circumstance that led you to a similar, a, a fortuitous scientific discovery, and it's it's sort of touching on the piece of bad luck turning into into good luck, which we right. did mention I just, some of them. I, I yeah. just wonder um, when that bad luck becomes good luck, and what that what the trials if, if you've gone through any trials that led you to then inverse the bad luck. Um. I've met the, the, I know the lady you're talking about, and it's quite an extraordinary story. And it, it's not a very thick book, so I encourage everybody to read it because it's quite an up, a very uplifting book. Um, what, touch wood, I've never, touch wood, <laughs> I've never <laughs> suffered a stroke yet. Um, a stroke of insight. A stroke of insight. Well, but hers was a, a real stroke, you know, a very serious stroke. 
uh, which she analyzed as it happened. It's the most extraordinary story and survived to tell the tale and, and is almost completely recovered. Um, but I've, I've had experiences that have completely changed my views about things. And, and I was telling the story, um, when, when I took over the Science Museum, I entered as a sort of fully paid up member of uh, what we call the information deficit model. That is that, that scientists are experts, that non-experts are empty vessels, and that if you want to persuade them that, for example, um, human-induced climate change is true, all you have to do is pour in, you know, speak slowly and clearly, and pour in the information, and everybody will get it. And uh, that's, the, and of course, that's absolutely not the way that people make sense of the world at all. You know, their unconscious mind is making decisions, and then they tend to justify the decision that they've taken without even realizing they've taken it. And uh, and so that you, people don't work in a rational way, and scientists don't either. And it was an experience at the science museum where somebody, the, the word belief came up, and I got all hot and bothered and said, listen, this is science. We're not talking about belief. We're talking about conclusions. And they very bravely said, well, um, the people who come to the Science Museum, by and large, aren't expert scientists, and so they believe. And by the way, Chris, I bet you believe a lot more than you think you do, to which my thinking was, your card is marked, mate. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't, because three years later, um, it concluded that that comment was completely right. That, that scientists tend to believe that they, they have this hubris that we are impartial evaluators that we conclude. But actually, we take an awful lot uh, on the basis of belief that the scientific process delivers ultimately truth, and that things about which we are not expert, but which we rely on as part of our narrative, are true because the scientific process has worked. And what we've seen uncomfortably of late is that this isn't always the case. By and large, truth will out, but it's a long and lengthy process, and there can be long periods where untruth is believed in. Um, so it's not quite the same experience, but, but for me, it was as profound, because I find that I, it's, it's, it's not an, an un, unthinking belief, but belief is much more part of my scientific um, awareness than I had previously appreciated. There is a great danger in getting too enmeshed in a scientific theory and believing that you know the way forward um, because of something you have experienced and you can actually distort the results of an experiment if you believe too much. And uh, there was a thing called the photoelastic effect, which um, a technician thought he had discovered, which was that essentially if light fell on to a material, it changed its elastic properties. And uh, he did many experiments and reported them, and it was followed up in Russia, and a lot of people reported on it, a lot of papers were published. But when the scientist who was responsible for the technician thought about this and realized his technician was becoming very, very famous for this, he thought, how can this happen? I mean, what is this? So he got together with the technician and said, I want you to repeat the experiments. And the technician repeated the experiments saying, uh, well, well, it was the hardness he actually was measuring. And that depended on uh, a thing called a, a hammer going a noop hardness test, and you had to judge the radius that the hammer made when it went into the material. But what the scientist did is he got the technician to repeat the experiment without telling him whether the light was switched on or off. And he showed conclusively that it was completely random. There was no effect. The Russians didn't like it, but it was entirely this theory that they had that they were reading they knew when the light was on, so they would interpret the radius that it was there. It was very, they were being very honest in a way, but it was because they knew what they were expecting. And it's very dangerous. You've got to be careful. You've got to treat your own theories with the suspicion that you give to other people's theories. And that's not very human. Could I endorse that? Because if you look through the 10 examples of luck that I wrote down, 
when I was writing them down, I couldn't think of a bad example. <laughs> but that's got to be nonsense. It means I'm screening out the bits of ill luck. Um, maybe they were just overridden by the good luck. But I mean, I'm very conscious that luck was always positive. I was never aware, or I was only able to recall incidents of bad luck. That's why I think there was a, an inspiration behind the construction of these tree ring chronology. <laughs> Here's one more here, and that's probably the last one. Jyoti Patacharya, professor of psychology at Goldsmiths. Uh, on that point, I'm just thinking whether are we, because of our psychological bias, are we amplifying the role of luck, or do we consider the luck is an essential ingredient for scientific creativity? Was that addressed sort of to me? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone. Everyone. Mm. Um, the trouble is, um, you mentioned earlier I am from Ireland. Uh, there is an, uh, an awful tendency to want to make the story as good a story as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the luck, and they're all true, but the, the, you do sort of go, oh, well, that's another good one. You know, put that in. So, yes, you are, you are slightly guilty of that approach? I think it's, uh, I think it's both. It's, it's our own psychology, um, but it's also um, the, the, on the social level as well, it's about the stories that we want to tell about luck. And those two are mutually reinforcing because um, when kids are at school or even at university learning about science, what are they told? They're told the, the big stories of science. So they're encouraged to map their own lives in a similar way. So I, I think it's both, um, I'm, I'm sure there are those, those innate effects such as um, um, Darren Brown was able to demonstrate so beautifully psychologists have written about um, very scientifically. But then there's also that social level that kind of channels us down that, that line, if you like. It's very easy to uh, distort the history, of course. Because if you're in the right place at the right time, then what you've done gets remembered. But you tend to forget being in the right place at the wrong time or in the wrong place at the right time because it doesn't get remembered. So automatically it builds up. Um, I don't know that I agree. I, I'm very conscious of being in the right place at the wrong time most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and at the wrong place at the right time at other times in my life. I, I think what we're really talking about here is, 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 is not really luck. It's just a nice narrative. Um, if, if, if you have a chain of events that ultimately lead to a successful outcome, something you can identify, you know, a, a new piece of understanding, then anywhere down that chain of events, you might have had a broken link, and, and that might not have been the same story. Maybe the story would have ended halfway along, or maybe there would have been some other story that would have ended up at the same place. As I say, I think when we tell, when we try and make sense of things, it's just comforting to kind of rationalize things and say, well, you know, if I hadn't been on that airplane sitting next to so-and-so, they would never have said that and I would have never known this. So you're always going to find somewhere down that chain of events something that appears to be lucky. And I think we're just very human at trying to tell these narratives in that sort of way. Um, I, if I'm allowed one last comment on luck, you know, look, looking back on my scientific career, I've had a you know, really interesting career. But I, th I think the thing that I regard myself as luckiest about is that there have been two or three occasions where some problem has been nagging away and irritating me. Sometimes it's you know, a mathematical solution or sometimes it's just understanding how something works. And it, and it is one of these unconscious things. You know, you, you either wake up at four in the morning or you're just doing something, and all of a sudden this big flash comes in, and it's, it's the ultimate, you know, solving a crossword or, or solving a problem that everybody enjoys. But you know for an instant that you know something that nobody else has ever known. And then you run out and tell somebody, and they say, oh, Fred told me that six weeks ago, <laughs> or whatever. And so, but for, that, for those few short minutes, and maybe, if you're lucky, for reality, you were the first person to figure that out. Yeah. 
and that is so satisfying. You cannot imagine how wonderful that is. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't have described it in the same words, but I think it, all of us know exactly what you're talking about. It's a very good moment to stop. I was instructed to draw this part of the discussion to a close at 8 o'clock, and it is 8 o'clock. Um, can I thank you all for being here, for participating, and my colleagues here, because it's been quite interesting being part of providing it, hasn't it? So thank you very much.